I'm forcing him, people. I'm forcing him. We're going live. It is the Brian and Dan hour. I am the Dan of the Brian and Dan. And one other person here with me is the Brian. That's right. Me. Right? Absolutely. The one and only. <clears throat> Coming to you live from the random rooms in our homes in two different states. Yes. <laughs> Quite um, a distance apart, actually. Yeah, we are. Pretty good, <clears throat> pretty good distance between the two of us. Yeah. Plane flight between us because I had to fly out to go to Connecticut and you had just had to drive down the road. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, oh, it has been an interesting summer so far across this planet. I mean, if you're, if you're watching the news, currently Hawaii is on fire. I know. It's terrible. Awful what's happening there. I'm, and it's so awful. I, I actually have people I know out there. Were, you know, now they're not where the major fires are happening. They're on a different island. But they said the problem they're having is, you know, when a big fire spreads in California or Arizona or something like that, they have neighboring states. They have other people there that are sending in help. Hawaii is a long distance from a lot of other people. So it's hard. And they, it's just terrible. Yeah. Hello, Valerie. Hello to my aunt. Hello, welcome. Oh, what was that? My goodness. We do have a guest tonight. Uh, yes. Hopefully, uh, he's some technical issues trying to get on, but he is uh, coming on. It's a fascinating guest. I've, I've done several book signs with him, and I think, yep, there he is. He's down on here. We'll be introducing him soon. Um, we lo we love all the technical stuff in this world. Compute this magic glowy box that people call computer is so much fun and yet so much stress so much stress yeah yeah now last weekend i went to a harry potter event uh, here in michigan and it was a load of fun and then i found out when i went there they have a comic con that hold this place called canterbury village is the place where it's at it's a the place is like a permanent renaissance fair set up you know the buildings the paved roads and all that but they hold all kinds of events there well they're going to do their own comic con this uh, not their first one either so apparently they've done this before and i asked him i said uh, do you have space for an author and they were super excited so next saturday and sunday i'm going to be in canterbury village michigan where i'll be doing a book signing there so that's gonna be fun if anybody is in the area, it, it, Canterbury Village is a really nice little place. Uh, really quaint, well designed. It's outdoor and indoor. There's a lot of stuff going on. So I'll probably be outdoors. I haven't got my word yet of where they set up people like me, but if they are, I'll, be, I'll have tent and stuff, but I'll be outdoors. So this will be an interesting event. I've not done a book signing outdoors like this before. So that's going to be news for me. But they hold, they, they hold their own Ren Fest there during the summer. And then the weekend after that and going forward, I'm doing the Michigan Ren Fest, which is goes from uh, actually next weekend. I, they both start at the same time next weekend, all the way through September. Every weekend they have Michigan Ren Fest and I'll be at that, too. So lots of stuff coming up. And it, the, the Michigan Ren Fest ends on my birthday. The very last day of it is my birthday. So I mean, fun there. Mm -hmm. Have you done any uh, Renaissance festivals, Brian? Uh, you need to. You need to. Okay. They're they're not. They, they can be crowded, but they're not like a comic con. They're mostly outdoors, so you do get that that openness that kind of helps. But it's it's fun. Yeah. So I've never done one. No. <clears throat> so we got on here. Heather, hello, Heather and Amber and Barbara. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And anybody else is watching on YouTube and. Are we on? Let's say we're on YouTube, Facebook. That's it. That's Just, it right now. That's it for now. Yes. Okay. We so, used to be on Twitch, but then I'm like, why? I, <laughs> we're I, not I, playing games. So yeah. who watches on Twitch if you're not playing games? So speaking of which, I just finished a major storyline in Heroes Rising. So people who are following that, I ended it on a really nasty cliffhanger because I like torturing people. It's a hobby of mine. Oh, it's and, fun. It's fun. And uh, I'm. I, I've already got a lot of people asking me what happens, what happens, what happens. I'm like, ah, you'll have to wait until I write it. And I haven't written it yet. So when I get, I, I know what I'm doing. I've got all, all the notes written down, but uh, 
the next major story probably will land in a couple months, and that should be the grand conclusion to this arc that's been running the entire year. So lots going on there, which is which is fun for me. I love writing the story for this game. It's a totally different experience than writing books or anything. Getting people involved, that's always fun. So there we go. Okay. Well, um, if we have nothing else, I can introduce our guest for tonight. Sure. Uh, I have, well, I would say our guest tonight is a, has done a lot of tie-in writing, which means he writes material that's in other people's canon, like Star Trek and Halo and uh, Alien and all these different things. He's written stories for that. And I'll say his name's Keith. I'll let him pronounce his last name because I butchered it every time I said it. So here's Keith. Hello. Welcome. welcome. And uh, it's pronounced Decandido, just by the way. Uh, Decandido. <laughs> Yeah, yes, no. uh, and I've never actually I've never actually written for Halo. Um, oh, I thought you had. No, uh, I've done Resident Evil. I've done Command and Conquer. I've done uh, Dungeons and Dragons in the game universe. Uh, some classic BattleTech short stories, but um, but I have not I have not uh, dipped my toe in the Halo universe. At least not yet. Eh, eventually, I'm sure it'll come up. <laughs> it could happen. Mm. Of course, of course, for me, I, I'm, you've written a lot of Star Trek stuff, which is what yes. you know. I, I was raised on as, as all the Star Trek books, from the the numbered series to the the voluminous series. So, uh, we've had other tie-in authors on here before, but I don't think I've, we've ever had anybody who has quite the um, how should I put it quantity. <laughs> of titles no. that you have. I, I sign for for people who are watching this. Pat, when I was in. Uh, um, the Connecticon, mm. Keith and I are right next to each other. So I had a good weekend of staring at all his books and I kept looking over and, and seeing something new. I'm like, oh, you've written for that. Oh, you've written for that. And I mean, he, he, he wrote books for Young Hercules. They, they spin off series from the Kevin Sorbo Hercules series. Which, which starred Ryan Gosling before, long before he was Ken. Uh. Yeah. So it just, <laughs> so that, that, tell us. Okay, a little about yourself. Go ahead and introduce yourself and, and more more than I can say. <laughs> um, I was born in a tiny fishing village in Cuba. No. Um, I, uh, I, uh, I, was, I was actually raised by a pack of feral librarians, um, which is actually almost true, um, uh, who read to me from a very young age and then gave me stuff to read uh, when I was old enough to read on my own. Uh, mostly what I read was um, The Hobbit and the Earthsea Trilogy mm. and Heinlein's YA books and P.G. Woodhouse's Jeeves stories. So that pretty much doomed me from, begin from the beginning. Um, I also grew up uh, reading comic books and uh, mostly Marvel, but uh, uh, and, and that was pretty formative on me as well. Um, I started writing. Well, the first thing I wrote uh, was a novel called "Reflection in My Mirror," which I wrote when I was six. It was terrible because I was six, but uh, I still have it too. It started to keep me humble. It's this little thing I did a construction paper at uh, summer camp one year, and um, I always wanted to write. It was like you know, I my parents, like I said, my parents read to me from from a very young age, and and I was always interested in being one of the people who who made us who made stories. So. Um, that desire was always there. Um, they didn't start paying me for it until much later. Um, <laughs> I started out uh, writing nonfiction uh, reviews, articles, uh, stuff like that for places like uh, Library Journal Magazine, uh, for the Comics Journal, uh, Publishers Weekly, Cream Magazine, a couple other places. And then um, uh, I worked as an editor in the field. Uh, I worked for the late Byron Price, who was a book packager. Um, editing, I was his science fiction and fantasy and horror editor uh, from 1993 until 1999. And um, uh, while, well, it was while I was working for him that I finally uh, started writing uh, fiction on a regular basis. Uh, sold a few short stories here and there, including um, uh, all tie-ins. Uh, one was for uh, Spider-Man anthology. My first one was uh, for a Doctor Who anthology. Um, mm. That actually gave me the completely irrelevant distinction of being the first native-born American citizen to write linear adult Doctor Who fiction. 
have to qualify it that much because John Peel is a naturalized American citizen. Uh, <laughs> and another uh, American uh, named uh, William H. Keith Jr., who's a friend of mine, mm -hmm. um, Bill wrote a Choose Your Own Adventure Doctor Who story before I did. But if you don't count John and you don't count Bill, then <laughs> I am the first American to write official Doctor Who fiction uh, with the story I did uh, in a 1996 anthology called uh, Decalogue 3. Hmm. And uh, I wrote, I did a Magic the Gathering story, and then I started doing novels. Uh, I did a Spider-Man novel, uh, 1998. I novelized a Fox TV movie called Gargantua. Oh, yeah. Yes, which starred Adam Baldwin as a marine biologist, which tells you everything you need to know about the movie right there. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, I did the Two Young Hercules books. That, that you mentioned. Uh, I did a Buffy the Vampire Slayer novel, and then I started writing for Star Trek, and it all got crazy from there. Uh, I wrote over a dozen Star Trek novels between 2001 and um, uh, 2009, and uh, also did some comic books, some novellas, uh, various other things. Uh, and I've also written in a lot of other universes, Resident Evil, World of Warcraft. Uh, I wrote three Supernatural novels, which are still in print and still selling today, as as you saw standing next to me, Dan. Um, yep. The 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 there's still a huge fandom for Supernatural, and three novels which I wrote in 2007, 2008, and 2010 are still uh, selling. Um, which which certainly makes my uh, my royalty statements happy. And <laughs> um, uh, and. Uh, so I've continued to write the, my most recent tie-in work. In 2019, I novelized the game uh, Alien Isolation, uh, which is based both on the movie series and also on the game of the same name that came out in 2014, yeah. and uh, which focuses on Ripley's daughter uh, between the first two Alien movies. And um, uh, and I'm also I've got a Resident Evil comic book, which is in the process of coming out. The first two issues are out now. The third issue should be out next Wednesday. Um, and, uh, and it'll be five issues altogether. It's a prequel to the Netflix animated series, um, Infinite Darkness. Mm. Uh, it focuses on the character of Leon, who's uh, one of the most popular characters in the, in the franchise. And I've done other stuff too. Uh, there, there's TV shows, movies, games. Um, I think I mentioned I wrote a World of Warcraft novel. Um, and, uh. I did a novel. I did a, a leverage novel based on the, the TNT show, which is one of my favorite shows. That was fun. I love leverage. Yeah, um, it, that was that was a tr that was a real privilege. I enjoyed the hell out of working on that. Um, I also did a lot of work for Farscape, mm -hmm. um, the the sci fi show that was produced by the Jim Henson Company from 1999 to 2003. Uh, I wrote the one of the novels. One of the tie-in novels, which came out in two thousand one, called House of Cards, did a couple short stories for both the official magazine and for the role-playing game, and then in two thousand eight, I got to work with Rock Neil Bannon, who created the show, mm. uh, to do a comic book that was basically the fifth season of the show. We we continued the show after the Peacekeeper Wars miniseries, uh, mm. and told new stories that that carried the the story of Crichton and Aaron and everybody forward. Uh, that went on for three years. We did uh, three four-issue miniseries, one. Ongoing series that lasted for 24 issues. There was also a Scorpius miniseries that uh, my friend David Mack wrote uh, with Rock Me. Uh, and I also did three Dargo-focused miniseries, um, which were which were a lot of fun. Uh, so, yeah, I've done a little bit of time work. So I said that, that, you, that you're skipping all over the place with that. That's just a <laughs> – which is it's a freaking awesome. I, I sat here – I was re re recollecting my childhood a little here – not just in the stuff you're you're working on. I'm like, this is stuff I followed, but also I have my very first book I ever wrote in the fourth grade called Private Eye Peyton, because I watched my mother raised me not only on Dune, Lord of the Rings, and that kind of stuff. She also raised me on stuff like Simon and Simon and, and Murder She Wrote. <laughs> so I wrote a story that was me as Private Eye Peyton, and as a tongue-in-cheek joke against myself, I've created Private Eye Peyton again in the video game I currently write for as the world's worst PI. <laughs> and But 
So I have that. I, I keep that just like you. I have it in a mm -hmm. book over here that's always to remind, remind me that from a very early age, all I wanted to do is tell stories. Yeah. And I didn't even realize then I could make money off of it. And I'm still trying to work on that part. But, you know, that's. So are we all, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, I just I just wanted to, wanted to be a part of it. And uh, that that I, I would walk into bookstores at a young age and first thing I look at the shelves and go, man, I wish I, I had my name on a book right here. And now I do. <laughs> so I've also I've done stuff in my own universes too. The the um, there's the precinct series, which is uh, my mix of epic fantasy and police procedure. Um, I've got an urban fantasy series, which I'm in the process of switching publishers on that one. But the first book uh, came out in 2019. It's called A Furnace Sealed. Uh, it takes place in New York City, which is where I'm from. Uh, and involves a guy, a supernatural hunter for hire named Brom Gold. Uh, I've written the second book. It's in editing right now, and I'm hoping to have both the reissue of the first book and the second book out next year. Um, and uh, I've written a bunch of other things. I've got another short, another urban fantasy short story collection. Um, I did one in 2013. I've, I've done I've done a cycle of short stories that take place in Key West, Florida, which is uh, a great way to make all my trips to Key West uh, tax deductible. Uh, which which is totally why I do it. Uh, but, uh, that and it's fun. I love Key West. I, I first went there in 1992? I want to say 93. 93. Um, and I fell in love with the place. I've been back there many times since, although I have not been back since 2016, unfortunately. Um, I want to get back down there. But uh, these are urban fantasy stories involving scuba diving, rock and roll music, Norse gods, folklore, and beer drinking. Not necessarily in that order. Uh, I put out my first collection of stories featuring um, my main character, whose name is Cassie Zukov, who's uh, kind of a weirdness magnet. The first collection was called Ragnar Rock and Roll, and it came out, as I said, in 2013. And finally, a decade later, uh, I've got enough stories for a second collection, which is coming out later this year, which is called Ragnar Rock in a Hard Place. <laughs> and I figure I got another 10 years before I can come up with another rock pun to use. Um, <laughs> So that uh, I, yeah, I was about to say, get you into your, you know, just Keith's work, not somebody's work that you put your name on. But yeah, yeah, you know, Keith's and work. And I'm also Keith. this close to uh, a deal for an urban fantasy, but I can't talk about it yet. Okay, so so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll avoid that. Uh, <laughs> I'll say one thing. I also uh, now, now that I followed you ever since we met back in Dragon Con last year, right. and seeing all your posts, I. I get. I've now gotten addicted to finding every article you're writing, especially on tour, <laughs> of all your rewatches and yeah. and your your analysis of the shows, which is just. I love the wry humor. I love the 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 true critical eye on that. And then you know, so if anybody if anybody falls, go go to tour.com and just look up Keith's work there on his rewatching of the Star Trek series, particularly Enterprise and the newer shows. Because he does a pretty good, you know, deconstruction of the show and what what worked, what didn't work, and sometimes what should never have been put there. <laughs> so that kind of gets back to your roots. Of... For, for twelve years, I That's started I started that in twenty eleven with a Next Generation Star Trek Next Generation rewatch, uh, and then I moved on to Deep Space Nine uh, in twenty thirteen, and then back to the original series in twenty fifteen. Uh, and then I did other things, and then I did Voyager starting in 2020, which I started that in January of 2020. That was actually the 25th anniversary of Voyager. And that turned into, like, my major – it turned into a much bigger deal than intended because of, you know, what happened in 2020. And that 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 became, like, a really good thing for a lot of people, just something for people to look forward to. You mm -hmm. know, every Monday and Thursday there was going to be a new Voyager rewatch, and you know, it was, and it gave me something to focus on too uh, during mm -hmm. that rather ridiculous year. Um, and then when I finished Voyager, I did Enterprise, and also since 2017, I have been reviewing the new episodes of the new shows that are on Paramount Plus as they come out. Um, so I've covered basically once I'm done with Enterprise, I will have covered pretty much everything. <laughs> have you uh, have you ever had anybody? contact you upset with your assessment of the show oh, sure. <laughs> lots of times um say that. the worst the absolute so one of the things i wrote for tour uh, that wasn't star trek i from 2017 until uh 2020 i did uh a feature called four color to 35 millimeter the great superhero movie rewatch 
uh, where I looked at, I, I rewatched every single live action movie based on a superhero comic book, of which there have been, you know, a few. Um, by January of 2020, I had caught up to real time. I, I didn't have anything left. I, I'd reviewed everything that had come out. Um, but because they keep making these things, I revive the feature every six months to a year. Um, in when I when I when I did um, Zack Snyder's Justice League, uh, that got me a certain amount of vitriol from a bunch of people on Twitter, or whatever Twitter is called these days. It was still called Twitter then. Um, basically tearing me to pieces for daring to to speak ill of the mighty Snyder. Um, these were all people who didn't read the article, as far as I could tell, uh, were unaware, who thought I was just, you know, some random internet guy who decided to take a shot at Zack Snyder. So were blissfully unaware that this was a regular feature that had been going on for five years at that point, um, where I was covering every single live-action movie based on a superhero. And since this was a live-action movie based on a superhero comic book, it kind of behooved me to talk about it. Um, yeah. The, the, the fact that I wasn't particularly favorable toward it didn't help, I'm sure. Um, yeah. I've... Although I did, I mean, I did, I was, I wasn't completely negative about it. For one thing, one thing I absolutely adored about the movie was that it act, Cyborg was an actual character in the movie, uh, which he was not in the theatrical version. Um, but, you know, none of, none of the dweebs on Twitter actually, you know, read the article, so none of them, they just, they just saw the little thing where I said I didn't like it and they started attacking me and making veiled or not so veiled threats and that was the most unpleasant interaction uh, for, for, for one of my tour articles. Most, I'll say that's... most people have been very polite and you know I mean lots of people have disagreed with me. There's been you know and I and I have had some opinions that have been decidedly unpopular where everybody's like what are you thinking? Um, you know and, and episodes I love that most people hate and most people and episodes that I hate that most people love. That's what makes horse races. That what what keeps life interesting, and in general, every, people are generally pretty nice about it. Yeah. So one thing I, I really enjoy about your, uh, you know, deconstruction of the episodes is that you you truly do give an honest expression of each part and find typically something that is of merit, even if it's not the, the episode itself. Really, it's not that great. So that's one thing I do enjoy. Because I think we've lost that in a lot of, of common culture. We're, we're headline readers. That's what happened to you. Yeah. They read a headline and they comment on it. I'm like, yeah. you know, that's why news news organizations now give very uh, clickbaity headlines because they know people just look at a headline. I'm like, read the article. <laughs> I, I just I just go for bad puns, but uh... <laughs> so as, that's something that as I people look those up, it's they're really good. It's a really good assessment for the shows that you, you've looked at and. Looking at the, uh, especially for me, I was I'm a big Star Trek fan. However, I was a big holdout for Enterprise because when it first came out, I was not impressed. And so I didn't watch the series. And then I went back and I think the same time I watched the series 2020, maybe 21, when I had, we all had the extra time on our hands and streaming services were, were milking us for money. We, I went on and I, I, we, we binge watched the whole series over a couple months and I got done with it and was like, this wasn't what I was expecting. It had some good, it had some bad, but, and then when you, when you gave your, when you give your reviews, I'm going, that's kind of what I was thinking here. It's, it's been, Enterprise was the Star Trek show of, of all the, the, the first wave basically of, of Star Trek spinoffs um, that ran from 87 to 05. That Enterprise was the one I was least familiar with because I didn't watch it as consistently. Um, and I didn't, it and Voyager both. Voyager, I was more I'd, I'd seen more of, but I'd also missed large chunks of it. Um, Enterprise, like I until I did my rewatch, I had not watched a single episode of the third season of Enterprise at all. I I watched it. I watched most of the first season, bits and pieces of the second, and almost all of the fourth. The fourth, I wound up needing for reference a lot for works of fiction that I was doing. Um, mm -hmm when uh while i was still writing star, star trek fiction on a regular basis so there were a lot of i i saw most of the fourth season just out of necessity because i needed it for th for work i was doing um but i hadn't seen a single episode of the third season so that was more of a watch than a rewatch. <laughs> um 
uh, and and it was and it was an interesting experience uh, coming to it new like that. Yeah. Let's see. First, uh, my mother's actually on watching. Manita. Hi, mom. She says hi, and she says she liked Enterprise, and it it wasn't a negative experience. It's just in comparison to other Star Trek I like, it didn't hold up as well. And Heather, if you've been listening, she says, "Have you guys wrote or been part of anything other than Star Trek related?" Uh, yeah, he went through the list. It's extensive. Um, he's written for many, many different things. Marvel, Supernatural, World of Warcraft, Alien, um, Classic Battletech, uh, Command and Conquer, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, um, not mm -hmm. like, uh, Young Hercules, uh, Orphan Black, Farscape, Doctor Who. Um, so, yes. Heroes, uh, Andromeda. Uh, I did a Xena short story at one point a while back. Uh, so, yeah, lots of different things. Lots of stuff. So, yep. Uh, Zorro. Um, so, and, uh, when you got started with your first tie-in work, what mm -hmm. was your very first, you said it before, what was your first tie-in work? Uh, it was a Spider-Man short story. Okay. Uh, how did you get this? How did you, were, how were you able to do this? Well, I was, um, uh, it actually came about because I have. You ask any ten writers how they broke into the field, you will get twelve different stories. Um, and mine is particularly non-replicable. Uh, I was, as I said, working for for Byron Price, and we had. Uh, when I started working for Byron, he was in the midst of acquiring the license from Marvel to do uh, novels and short story anthologies based on their superheroes. The first two books we did uh, were Spider-Man books. Uh, a a novel by Diane Duane, which was the first in a trilogy. Uh, that novel was called The Venom Factor. Uh, Titan recently reissued that trilogy in a single volume, actually. Um, the So we had that. And then we also did a short story anthology, which was called The Ultimate Spider-Man. This was in 1994, so six years before Marvel did their ultimate line. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, this was this was a rush production because the license cost a great deal of money, and so Byron wanted uh, the books to be published and earning money, earning that money back as quickly as humanly possible. So we were jamming this thing through production. We actually had the cover done before all the stories were in, and so the cover was a, a framed cover. It had Spider Man in the middle, and then the four corners were uh, four of his villains. Uh, Dr. Octopus, the Lizard, uh, the Vulture, and Venom. We had a Dr. Octopus story. We had a Lizard story. We had a Vulture story. In fact, we had two. We did not have a Venom story. This was not for lack of trying. Um, for those of you who don't know, the process by which... Sorry, I'm sinking into my bed here. Uh, the process by which a tie-in book is done is you have to write a uh, plot outline first. That's also true for short stories, not just novels. Before you write a single word of your story or your novel, the plot has to be approved by the people who own it. We had sent a half dozen different Venom proposals by six different authors to Marvel, all of which were rejected. We are past the 11th hour at this point. Uh, and me and my co-editor, John Betancourt, uh, are... We go to Marvel and say, "Look, we got to have a Venom story." I mean, this is this was 1994. Venom was by far Spider-Man's most popular villain. Plus, he's on the damn cover. We, got, um, and and we can't not have a Venom story anyway. Like he was he was Spider-Man's most popular villain at the time. So, Marvel gives us a sentence. Based on that sentence, John and I wrote a story because there wasn't time to assign it to anybody. So I went home, I wrote a draft of the story, John tore it apart, rewrote it from the ground up, gave it back to me, I tore it apart, rewrote it from the ground up, gave it back to him. There are parts of that story I know John wrote. There are parts of that story I know I wrote. I, for example, wrote the fight scenes. John is terrible at fight scenes, by his own admission. Um, there are parts of that story I don't have the first damn clue who wrote. <laughs> um, uh, but that's how I made my first story sale was basically out of desperate necessity to get the damn story in there. Um, after that, I did, I did, a, I did other stories for some of the other Marvel anthologies. We did a silver surfer anthology. We did a, um, 
uh, a Hulk anthology, an X Men anthology, all of which I had stories in. Uh, we did a second Spider Man anthology that I did a story by myself with as well. Um, but also, being an editor gave me the opportunity to pitch things. Um, the Doctor Who story I mentioned came about because one of the two editors of that anthology was Andrew Lane, from whom I had bought short stories uh, for the X-Men anthology we did, as well as uh, another anthology. So I was talking to Andrew all the time, and he mentioned in passing he was doing a Doctor Who anthology, and I was like, I've been a Doctor Who fan since I was eight. Can I pitch a story, please? <laughs> Uh, and then I still had to, you know, come up with a pitch, and they had to like it, and they had to, you know, it had to be approved by the BBC and the whole rest of it. Um, and uh, so that's how that happened. Okay. Also, we have a few people. Chris Evans has joined. Hello, Chris. Um, different Chris Evans. Uh, I was going to say, I, I'm impressed that we got Captain America in here. Uh, <laughs> I, I have I've actually Chris has, has reviewed a lot of my books on Amazon and stuff and I've posted I post people's reviews in, at times as advertising mm -hmm. and I post Chris Evans. I had someone contact me and say, You take that down. I don't think lying is a good way to advertise. I was like, What? It, it was his review. No <laughs> nobody's gonna believe Chris Evans reviewed your book. I'm like, I didn't even think of that. I yeah. was like, oh, oh no, not not that Chris. <laughs> Poor Chris. <laughs> there, there, there is there. I don't know if it's the same guy. But there's a guy on Twitter who's who's on uh, whose Twitter handle is not Captain America. And his name, his real name is Chris Evans. Uh, it's not that rare of a name, people. So no, it really isn't. <laughs> but, but you know, it, 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 some people were really impressed. I'm like, thank you, but. Yeah. <laughs> so what was uh, speaking of your, going back to your tie-ins here again? Mm -hmm. Actually, first I'm gonna ask Heather asks, have you written anything crime or mystery? Now I know your yes. your precinct ones are they're kind of on the the crime or the mystery. Yeah, I've 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 done a lot of um, fantastical police procedurals, uh, basically cop stories that take place in fantasy settings or science fiction settings or superhero settings. Um, I've also done some straight up mysteries. Um, the I did it one of the one of them was a, a tie in. I did a CSI New York book back in uh, two thousand eight. Um, and I've also written a Sherlock Holmes short story that just came out uh, about a month ago. Uh, it's part of a book, uh, an anthology called Cases by Candlelight, Volume 2, uh, which has four new uh, Sherlock Holmes stories by myself, Michael Jan Friedman, Aaron Rosenberg, and Christopher D. Abbott. Um, nice. I've also done a couple of stories uh, for an alternate, uh, a series of alternate Sherlock anthologies where it was different versions of Holmes and Watson. So I did two stories featuring Shirley Holmes and Jack Watson in modern New York. Uh, and uh, I've actually got two more coming in the next couple of years uh, in two other anthologies. So I'm building up a whole series of Holmes pastiche uh, mysteries. But I've also done um, uh, the Dragon Precinct series that I mentioned. Is It takes place in an epic fantasy setting, but the main characters are cops. Um, so each one is a is a different uh, crime story of some sort, um, and uh, I've also done a novel, uh, three novellas, and a few short stories uh, in the world of the Super City Cops, which is cops in a city filled with superheroes. Uh, it's it, it was prompted by wondering what what kind of a nightmare it must be to be a, uh, an officer of the law in Gotham City or in Metropolis or in Marvel's version of New York, because um, you know it's not like these guys follow procedure or anything. <laughs> it was actually doing the Super City Cops was prompted by the Spider-Man novel that I did back way back in 1998. There was a scene I, I wrote in that that I was very proud of, and and because it, it was something that I always thought about. There's a cop who's talking to uh, Spider-Man and telling him about this one time when two got two officers out, you know, in their patrol car, and they see this guy webbed to a lamppost. To this day, they have no idea why the guy was webbed to a lamppost. He insisted he was on for no reason. There was nobody around who'd seen anything because he'd been hanging there for a while. Um, you know, nobody has any idea why he was there. So they just basically wasted a, a whole day, a whole shift of paperwork on a guy who they have no idea why Spider-Man webbed him to the lamppost at all. You know, it was probably somebody who, like, stole a purse. Spider-Man caught him, webbed him to the lamppost, and then Spider-Man went off because he was probably late for something because Spider-Man's always late for something. And... <laughs> Uh, and the person whose purse was stolen went on her way because, you know, she got her purse back. What the hell does she care? Um, and meanwhile, there's this guy who went to a lamppost who beats no justice for his act because nobody stuck around to actually make a statement. 
Yeah, th- that that is a thought that has crossed my mind a few times. I I love. I'm not a big comic book fan, as in I don't. I've never grew up reading them. I read novels, yeah. but I love superheroes. But I fell in love with Spider Man through video games. I play the Spider Man all Spider Man video games, and there are times I'm playing these, and I'm I'm like my my characters. I I've stopped this mugging. I stopped this, and I web these people to to cars and walls and stuff. And I go on my way, and I'm sitting there thinking. Is anybody gonna leave a note or something? <laughs> I mean, seriously, most of these people are unconscious. A couple of them are not because they're wiggling around and behind the webs, but they're all stuck to things. And the the person who is was well, the webbing dissolves in an hour at least. So. Yeah, but so yeah, that that's an interesting way to look at it. Yeah, I think that would be an interesting uh, um, short for them to do for Marvel, yeah. especially for especially. I think Spider Man is one that actually I, probably has that issue more than others because you're right, he's always running late for something yeah, yeah. so yeah but, uh, it, it, but yeah and i also um i've i've worked cops into like my spider-man stories and uh, my, one of my supernatural novels has uh, dean and sam working with an nypd uh missing persons cop um and and a bunch of other places as well so see as brian posted if anybody has any questions for keith you know pop them in here um questions about Tie-in writing, writing in general, his books. Put him in there. He'll be glad to answer him. I, I've, I've stood next to Keith now on several occasions, and he is at, never at a loss for words. Yeah, the problem is shutting me up usually. So. <laughs> Which putting us together can be a problem. <laughs> I, I'm the son of a preacher, so yeah. talking comes literally into genes. At, at, at Kineticon, they, they put me, Dan... Rick Hines and Marion G. Harmon in a booth. And I felt so sorry for Marion because I can't imagine he got a word in. Yeah. Marion's Marion's a nice guy, but he, he's not the most most talkative compared to the rest of us. No. Although he did well. He sold a lot of books. So. Well, yeah. We all do well. Connecticon was great fun. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking I forward to going back to it next year. Me too. So uh I'm trying to get into doing more uh Trying to get to some more shows by the end of the year. I'm going to be doing Dragon Con in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I envy you. I'm not. I'm. I didn't. I didn't. I couldn't afford to go there on my own if mm. I didn't get in, and yeah. I didn't know anything about being invited. I people saying, well, "I got my, I got my what invite or something." I was like, "You got what now?" Yeah, there's an application process to be a guest at Dragon Con. Yeah. I'm learning these things still. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dragon Con tends to work me pretty hard. Um, I'm doing. Um, hang on, let me let me call yeah. this up because I've I've I'm I'm calling up on my computer exactly how many things I'm doing. Let's see: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen panel items at Dragon Con. So, are you actually okay. signing books at a booth? Or are you just running between panels? Just uh, one of those seventeen items is an autograph session. Ah. Uh, with me and two other authors, which they've moved. Um, the the autograph sessions for authors has been had been in the Marriott uh, in the International Ballroom. They moved it to the West, and, and I'm hoping we'll get more foot traffic there, because um, a lot of the literary tracks are in the West in anyway. Um, and so uh, we'll see. Yeah, uh, last year was my first time at Dragon Con since 2002, mm. and I got in. Alexi got me in within three weeks before it happened because I didn't even know I, I had contacted him and just said, how, how do you sign up for dragon con? And he goes, Oh, I have space. So yeah. I had, I didn't have panels. I had nothing. I literally stood at the booth the whole time. And so that's, that was totally my experience there. So, yeah. but I saw the rotation of people going and coming and going and coming and doing that stuff. So yeah, of course well, my mother like- has to ask, how do either of you get words in? By writing incessantly and shutting up for at least an hour. <laughs> well, that's how I do it. Yeah. And Chris wonders, Brian, you looks a little stunned. You're kind of quiet there. <laughs> I have no idea. I looked at that. I'm like, what does he mean by that? I'm I'm perfectly fine. Thanks, you know. Chris. I'm good. <laughs> Dragon. What's fun about Dragon Con is that it's not so much one convention as a whole bunch of little conventions all mushed together into into four hotels <laughs> um, yeah you know each track has its own thing and its own personality and its own style um my personal favorite place uh at dragon con is the american sci-fi classics track 
uh, which is run by two lunatics named Joe Crow and Gary Mitchell. Uh, and it is a wonderful uh, exercise in nostalgia, for one thing, because uh, every everything there is basically at least 20 years old. That That's what defines it. Like, there's there's American sci-fi media, which covers current, more current stuff. The classics track is specifically for older things. Um, but it's also a completely warped and ridiculous uh, room full of weirdos like me. Um, one of my favorite things that we started doing is the Battle of the Fictional Bands. <laughs> Which which is a battle of the bands in, in a in a you know uh, in a bracket of different fictional bands, um, uh, the the Doctor Teeth and the Electric Mayhem and Wild Stallions and Emmett Otter's Jug Band have all done very well at this uh, to the point where they're no longer eligible. We have to like <laughs> uh, that would be fun for me yeah. for the simple fact that I'm a huge classic television nerd. I've had I've sat down and had lunch with with uh, um, Adam West. I mean. Mm. I've, I've I've got an original genie bottle that given to me by Barbara Eaton. I mean, I love classic TV, so that would be that'd be where I'm sitting and just absolutely enjoying it. One one of the things the Classic Track did during the apocalypse of 2020 was do the do a series of uh, weekly quarantine panels, and they still do them periodically, uh, not as often as they did. Uh, but like in the time between Dragon Cons, uh, doing panels on various things, that's how Battle of the Fictional Bands got started. <laughs> so for one of those. Um, and it became so, its own. Mom thing. asks, "Does it have Josie and the Pussycats?" Yeah, they're 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 one of the eligible ones. And Chris asks, uh, "Did you do any panels at Kineticon?" I can yes. say yes, he did because he sat next to me at least in one of them, yeah. or two of them. Yeah, we did the book cover and we did superheroes, didn't we? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And yep. then there was a world building panel. Yep. Yeah. So we did all three. I don't know if you were on. Were you on that one? Yep, I was on world building. You're right. Um, so we did three. Of them. And I, I'm yeah, that, that weekend. Yeah, each day. Um, but yeah, no, that was a. I I love doing panels. I love talking about things, as you may have noticed from the way I've been babbling for the last 42 minutes. Um, but uh, it's 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 a lot of fun. And it's a great you know it's a great way to to you know connect to people and answer questions and such. Yeah, this one at Kineticon, I got to do a panel that I had wanted to do for a long time. I have worked on some similar to it, but doing the book cover panel, mm -hmm. talking about how to do you know book covers, what's good, what's bad, how it works, what doesn't work, and because uh, I that's one of the things that I get a lot of requests on on uh, assessing people's book covers and helping them with it. I, in fact, to this afternoon, I had someone contact me while I was in the middle of working on something. They're like, I have a book coming out. They say you can look at book covers and help out. And I looked at the book cover and I was like, hey, here's your 14 points. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm I'm unapologetically critical, but not rude because no, no, no new author needs to have a, a sarcastic jerk, you know, but they definitely need. Yeah, they'll to get enough. Of, they'll get enough of those on Amazon. So. <laughs> Just go on to form, the site formerly known as Twitter. Yeah. Do you have a stitch sitting behind you? Sorry, yep. Brian noticed that earlier. That's my wife's. Okay, um, she, she is the stitch fan. Um, I mean, I like stitch too, but the, it's her stuffy. Um, but the uh, the ones behind me are mine. There's uh, the the otter and the tiger and the gargoyle. So. We have we have a lot of stuffies. Um, I also have my bear. Is that the dragon? Have, that is Colin Baron. Yes, that is Toothless from How uh, How to Train oh, Your Dragon. Okay. Um, our, our 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 well, our entire house looks like it belongs to a very intelligent twelve year old girl. Um, because uh, we are we are awash in stuffed animals and books. Yeah, I actually have the first teddy bear that's ever given to me. And it was I was going to be the year I was born, so I still have that. I uh, um, I, I especially have a lot of stuffed tigers. I love tigers. Tigers are awesome. So I have a quick question, a question for you on my end here yeah. is uh, um, I'm doing a Comic-Con this coming weekend that's going to be at a Renfest location where I'm going to be sitting outside and it's very different. It's maybe the weirdest con I've done. What's, what's the weirdest one you've done? Um, I don't know if I, I, I call it. Hmm. It wasn't really weird. It was just bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping this is just weird. It's good. Yeah. Oh no. Okay. I. Uh, some people flew me out to Dayton, Ohio, to uh, nominally put, 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 uh, advertise their comic shop, and they like got me appearances on TV and such. And it was just really bizarre, and I wasn't really sure what was being accomplished there. Um. 
you know, I did I did some local appearances in in various places, and and they put you know they flew me out, they put me up, and it was just weird. Um, you know, I mean, they gave me, I, I had to wear a T-shirt that belonged to the comic store, which I guess was the point of the exercise, but it just. I, I wasn't really sure what what the logic was there and what they were trying to accomplish. The worst was a show in oh god, I don't remember what year it was anymore. Time time has lost all meaning. I think it was in 2013, maybe, um, maybe later, maybe earlier. I don't remember. It was uh, sometime in the 2010s. Uh, it was a show called 2050 Events, which was held in Daytona Beach, Florida, uh, over uh, in October. It was a uh, Halloween. Uh, and they had the infrastructure of a giant convention that would get like 10,000 people at least. If as many as 5,000 people showed up the whole weekend, I'd be surprised. Nobody showed up. Um, I One of the guests was Gigi Edgley from Farscape. She and I were supposed to do a Farscape panel Friday night. Nobody turned up to the Farscape panel aside from her assistant and my wife. Um, wow. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, it was it was a total disaster. The only I mean, it was great for us. Um, you know, we got a free trip to Daytona Beach. I sold a few books at least, um, not a lot, uh, and I got to meet cool people. Uh, there were a bunch of voiceover actors there. I got to meet uh, Tony Dyson, who actually became a really good friend until unfortunately he passed away. Tony was the roboticist who designed R two D two. Um, and it was that's right. It was twenty fifteen because it was right when. Uh, Tony was getting invited to conventions because The Force Awakens was coming out. Mm. Um, so there was a revived interest in Star Wars at a lot of shows, and and because he he created the physical thing of R two D two, there was there was interest in having him at shows, uh, and so uh, he uh, he became a very dear friend. Unfortunately, like I said, he passed away a couple of years later, um, but he was a very nice guy. Uh, and it was worth it to meet him, but man, that was a disaster of a show. And apparently, they tried to like screw some of the some of the uh, voiceover actors out of their money. They did not do that with me, at least, probably because I didn't ha didn't cost that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, only only one I've ever done that was truly that bad was actually my very first Comic Con in Michigan. Mm. And now Michigan has where I'm at. There are two that are used to have them. One I think is gone is this one. Uh, mm -hmm. They have Michigan Comic Con and they have right. Motor City Comic Con. Right. Motor City Comic Con is fabulous. Well attended. Well, the place is fantastic. Parking is fantastic. I mean, the place is great. The show wow. is great. Every time I've been there. Okay, parking is fantastic is a phrase I don't think I've ever actually heard. So that's impressive. That's but I they live in New built, York. So. They built this convention center for Motor City Comic Con. Wow. Because the city in Novi, Michigan, was their old convention center they were using. They were having to tear it down. And they, the Ford used it. GM used it. The Motor City used it. But the show that used the most space and had the biggest turnout was always Motor City Comic Con. And so they said, well, we know we want to have, be able to put cars in here and put all this stuff in here. But we want you to tell us how you want us to make it. And so Motor City Comic Con got to design a convention center. Wow. So great. The other flip side? Michigan Comic Con is held at the Cobo Center, which is downtown Detroit. And Cobo Center used to be the the bike the this suburban show place, which is where the motor city is held, where mm -hmm. they show all the new cars, all the new stuff. But right the year before they did this show, Detroit tore down all the parking garages and did not put them back up. So Cobo Center has no parking. So you have to park within the city of Detroit somewhere, take the queue line down to there. So you're parking miles away to come to this convention or walk in Detroit. And so we went there and the, the, the show had plenty of A-list celebrities. The show had great space, lots of people, no customers. I, I left my booth and, and just wandered around and talked. I, I spent a half an hour chatting with Michael Dorn. Uh, we, I, I, um, Got to be good friends with uh, um, Matthew Lewis from Harry Potter. He actually grabbed some of my books, so he'd have something to read on the way home. Uh, I mean, th we were literally just kind of the vendors were walking around talking to each other because, and the thing is, the con people were going, this is not our fault. Mm. 
we, we, we scheduled this place and then Detroit said, sorry, we're going to take your parking away. So I think, I don't know if they've, if they've just dissolved or if they've moved it somewhere else, but that was bar none, the worst experience for the fact of nobody being there. I don't blame the con for it. And they didn't, as far as I know, try to screw anybody over on that one. But yeah. it was clear. No, yeah, but I, the 2050 events had the, the, a lot of sponsorship too. And I really, I, I suspect they took a real bath on that because the sponsors did not get their money for it. Mm. I have no idea what who is at fault there. I mean, it's possible the, the, there were. It was to some extent an experiment because uh, Daytona Beach isn't exactly a hotbed of, of genre conventions, um, but uh, and and I think they wanted to see you know to create a market for one. But there may just not have been enough people, or they just may have screwed it up. I don't know. So, Such uh, moving a little ahead here, back to what we were talking about, books and all. <laughs> I know you said you you've got your own books, the Dragon Precinct, and all the, the books that you've written. Um, what what inspired you just to get into your own work? I know you were doing lots of tie-in stuff. Was this something you just wanted to do all along, or you know, I'm just kind of curious about that. Well, I always I, I always wanted to do my own stuff all along. It was just you know the tie-in stuff was you know paying. So, <laughs> um, uh, but there there is value in in publishing work. You keep the copyright on it for no other reason than you control the rights to it. I mean. Um, you, you've seen me selling the tit Titan reissue, those three Spider-Man novels, one by me, one by Jim Butcher, one by Chris. The only money I make off that is ones I, is what I sell at conventions. I don't get any royalties on that because I don't control it. Um, it's entirely owned by the Walt Disney company. Um, and actually that particular book, I didn't get royalties on anyway. Um, but, uh, if they ever reprint, for example, the Venom Factor, my, my, uh, Venom Wrath, rather, uh, my first novel back in 98, my contract for that was with a company that does not exist anymore uh, and who no longer has the, right, the license to do stuff based on Marvel. So I won't see any money for that either. Um, I don't have any, if I do a short story collection, I can't reprint any of my tie-in stories. Whereas my original stuff, I control the rights to it, which also means theoretically somebody could decide to do a TV show or a movie out of it or a game. Um, and then I would benefit from that. Um, so that was part of it, you know. But also, I you know, I have stories I want to tell that aren't in other people's universes. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, the the okay. precinct series specifically came about from the two main characters who are based on role playing game characters uh, from one from college, one from in my twenties. Um, the the it's a. Torin Van Wivold was a ranger in uh, a D&D campaign in college. Uh, I created a whole backstory for him and all sorts of stuff, and he was a very long-running character. Wonderful character. I loved him. And uh, in, the early in, the, in the early 90s, um, I was involved in the playtesting of uh, what was eventually published as the Wild Side role-playing system, uh, which was a, a fantasy role-playing game with much more realistic combat uh, methods than D&D than &D had and, and some other features that were really cool. Uh, I had a character in that, Danfors Trusillian, who was a, a half-elf uh, warrior, and who also was a, a fairly long-lasting character, which is unusual. The Wild Side game, you don't get attached to your characters because <laughs> they will die quickly. It is a very, it's, it's a very brutal one. Um, I had two characters that lasted long. Danfors was one, and there was another one was one of like one of the worst roles I ever did. This was a, a guy who was had only one hand, uh, and and I decided that he was going to be an archer. He like created a bow that like attached to his thumb, and Lee was like, "Oh my god, this character's not going to last." He lasted like six months. Nothing could kill this guy. It was great. <laughs> but anyway, um, I've been wanting to do stories with those first two characters, Torin and 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 Danthris, and I'd started like five or six different really bad fantasy novels with the two of them. And then I hit on the idea of them being detectives. You know, I've, I've, I've been a fan of fantasy since I read the Earthsea Trilogy and The Hobbit when I was a little kid, and then The Lord of the Rings later on and other fantasy stuff. And I've been a fan of cop stories because I also grew up watching Barney Miller and Hill Street Blues. And so putting them together just seemed natural. Um, and so I did that. Um, and I've continued to do that. There are six novels and a short story collection so far. Um, with another novel and another short story collection due. And there's more stories I want to tell in that universe as well. So. I was curious also, 
um, you know, know you've, you've pitched a lot for your tie-ins that, and, and hope that they accept your pitch. And sometimes they don't. Oh, yeah. Have you ever have you ever taken something, a pitch idea, the framework, and retooled it into your own story? A um, couple times. Uh, one in particular was a uh, a game tie-in that wound up not working out, and I repurposed it as an original science fiction novel, which was supposed to be part of an ongoing series, but it was with a it was part of a shared world small press thing that that petered out, unfortunately. Um, but I was pleased with the with the individual book itself. It was um, it was fun, uh, especially since the part I got to excise one part of the game that that I never really liked. So <laughs> so it worked out well. Th that's about it. I think there was just that one, and there may have been one other, but um, not that much. I mean, a lot of the the stories I came up with were were actually no, that's not true. Uh, a couple of the Cassie Zukov stories, uh, one of them in particular, started out life as a Buffy the Vampire Slayer novel for us. Um, and, uh, and, uh, that, that did not get accepted. So I reworked it, uh, into, into that. Um, oh, there, there've been some that I've reworked like within, into different universes, you know, um, you know, but, uh, not that many though. So. Yeah. I, I've, I can say I've, I have a few uh, fan fiction pieces I've written for Star Trek that I eventually was like, I like the story. So I dissected it and turned it into something else. My Earth's Last Starship series is is heavily based on a, a Voyager fan fiction I wrote uh, almost two decades ago. Yeah. So, but the, the, you're, you're doing professional fan fiction here. I mean, Ty, yeah. <laughs> except, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I have someone who wanted to send me their Star Trek fan fiction because they saw a few people that I'm friends with was like, oh, would you show this to them? I had to very kindly first tell them that's not how it works. No. And if I if I handed this to one of them, they would shoot me. Secondly. No, we just give it back. <laughs> uh, secondly, I had to say, I had to look at him and go, you've made every mistake of fan fiction you can make in this. Please don't do this. <laughs> I won't I mean, go on with great, it. Because I don't... <laughs> both, both the great thing and the horrible thing about fanfic is that you can do whatever the hell you want. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm not really writing professional fanfic. I'm writing tie-in fiction, which is a different thing. And one of the differences is that everything I do has to be approved by the people who own it. Mm -hmm. uh, fanfic is under no such uh, provisions, which is which is both, like I said, it's both a benefit and a, and a hindrance. Um, but that, I mean, that that's why they're two different things. Um, I've written plenty of fanfic in my time. I've written, I've got a whole bunch of Marvel comics fanfic that me and some friends did back in the early nineties. Um, I wrote, I, my, my, my first wife and I wrote crossover fan fiction between uh, Hercules and Xena and Highlander. That's interesting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can still find them on the way back machine. Uh, <laughs> it was called the mythos Chronicles and it was uh it was a lot of fun. We we posited Aeolus, Hercules' sidekick, was an immortal. So he's still alive in the present day, and he meets, like, you know, uh, uh, Duncan McLeod and, and Richie Ryan and them. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, Zeno working with Mythos and the Four Horsemen. It was just, it was it was cool. That does sound interesting. We had a lot of fun with it. Um, but we also, like, the, the, there were, we were writing it while both shows were, you know, still running. And there was some stuff they did on both Hercules and Xena that didn't really work with what we were writing. Uh, and we also, we also thought it was really kind of stupid. So we ignored it because we could, it's fanfic. What the hell do we care? <laughs> you know? mm. Yeah. As I, as I told you at the convention, I had someone contact me and tell me that my, my Star Trek fan fiction is a rip off of Picard. And I, I said, look at the date. Yeah. I, I posted this on Wattpad uh, five years before Picard was ever on the air. Yeah. <laughs> so they stole it from me. At least I'll tell myself that it makes me feel yeah. better. <laughs> Which they, they no people they don't they they don't read fan fiction that no. would be poison to them. Mm. Um, oh, I'm sorry. My mother mentioned crayon box. Uh, I, I took me a minute to figure what she was saying here. We were talking about book covers, and I mean I brought that up at the at the yes at the panel that mm. I have encountered many 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 book covers from indie authors who are self publishing that. They, their kids drew it for them with crayons, and I just can't. No, that's not. No, don't do that. 
So, okay. Well, it looks like we are right at the cusp of the end here. So, uh, tell everybody where we, where they can find your stuff, which yeah. should be. Um, if you just search that name, this name here, um, I am the only Keith DeCandido that will turn up. Um, uh, my website is decandido.net, which is a horrible, horrible website that looks like it was designed by somebody who learned HTML in 1996, because I learned HTML in 1996. Um, but it does provide links to all the various places you can cyberstalk me. Um, you can find my books on Amazon.com, BN.com, Kobo.com, or whatever your online book dealer of choice is. Um, I am on Facebook uh, under my name. Uh, I am on whatever it is Twitter is called these days, at Craddock. I am on Instagram at Crad418. I have a YouTube channel called Crad Readings, where every month I do a reading of one of my short stories. Uh, if you do uh, a search for Crad, read, Crad, K-R-A-D, my initials, readings on YouTube, it should turn up. Um, I have a Patreon where I do TV and movie reviews, excerpts of my works in progress, vignettes featuring my original characters, uh, and first looks at my first drafts. And also cat pictures, which is the most popular tier out of all of them. <laughs> is the cat picture. And um, uh, and I'm also oh, and I have a blog, <laughs> um, decandido.wordpress.com, which I update fairly regularly. So and I talk about stuff. So. Nice. Zip, so you can find all of his works all over the place, and yep. him all over the place. And you will probably encounter him if you if you go to comic cons. There's a very high chance you'll encounter him at some point because yes. he's everywhere and all over the place. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, anything anything more, Brian? I don't think so. <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. So, well, thank you for being on here tonight, Keith. It's been My pleasure. a pleasure. Pleasure to have you here and talk to you. I uh, look forward to actually doing signings again together sometime in the near future. For sure. And uh, have fun at Dragon Con. Try not always to... I, oh, sorry, I did have one little question. I saw you <laughs> post earlier, and I'm, I'm racking my brain. You mentioned a Muppet panel? Yes, one of the panels I am doing, let me find it, is called a Muppet panel. Oh, yes. It's basically going to be a um, uh, battle of who is the best Muppet. Another one of those things like the Battle of the Fictional Bands will be a bracket. Okay. And we have to pick the best Muppet. This is going to be agony. So, uh, <laughs> but should be tremendous fun. So. Okay, I just saw that, and I, I was racking my brain, going, "Did he do tie and work with the Muppets?" No. That would be I did not even know they did that. All right, no. well, again, thank you. For I, being I here tried tonight. to actually because Boom Studios had uh, the rights to do comic books based on the Muppets, and one of the things they did were they were doing uh, various works of pu public domain literature redone with Muppets, and I had actually pitched a couple things to them, including the Muppet Odyssey, which would have been great, um, but they didn't go for it. Oh, okay. Well, then you could have done time work from Muppets. That's interesting. Yes. Okay. Well, again, thank you for being here tonight. And uh, everybody, we are we're definitely working on coming up. Uh, we are closing in on our favorite season, which, of course, is spooky season. We'll have our, our favorite guests who do ghost hunting and horror novels. And don't forget, as I always like to remind people, leave reviews for books you read. Yes. So, Oh, and Chris, uh, I do not have any shout outs tonight. <laughs> not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me this time. <laughs> getting every show. So, nope. All right. Well, I said good night, everybody. Yeah. Bye.